At the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, it says, Many have undertaken to compose an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by the initial eyewitnesses and servants of the world. For anybody with common sense, you would understand that Luke is telling us that there were original other Gospels that existed before the canonized Gospels of the Bible. Now, even though there are multiple books of the Bible in the New Testament, there are technically only four Gospels. These Gospels, of course, are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as many people are aware, there were Gospels that were taken out of the Bible when the Bible was finally put together soon after the Council of Nicaea. Of course, if you are joining along with us on the Dark Outpost, you already know that we have made it our mission to go through every single book that was excluded from the official canonized Bible. So today is our recap of the work we talked about last night on The Dark Outpost. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button and give us a like. Also, again, a very special thank you to all our patrons who help make this channel possible, especially our producer, Tiffany Monroe, who again is a Reiki master here in Atlanta, Georgia. If you would like to contact Tiffany regarding her services, her email is listed down below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today we're going to be talking about the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Now, the Gospel of Mary was found in 1896 in Arkmen, Egypt. It ended up making its way to Berlin, Germany with some other missing texts from the Bible as well. Well, of course, we then had World War I and World War II, so the original Gospel of Mary was not published for the public until around 1955. Sadly, like many of the missing Gospels of the Bible, a lot of the Gospel of Mary is missing. Because these Gospels are written on papyrus, it turns to dust after a while, and of course, ants do get to it. In fact, the fact that they were preserved in Egypt, and as well as the Dead Sea with the Dead Sea Scrolls, was the best for the papyrus to survive as long as it has because of the dryness of the deserts. But nonetheless, what we have available to us that is the Gospel of Mary is enough for, under, for us to understand the principal teachings of this Gospel. We know that this Gospel was most likely written towards the end of the first century AD and possibly at the latest into the second century AD. This would make this Gospel really close to the original teachings of Jesus. Not only does it make the Gospel really close to the original teachings of Jesus, but as we learn from the Gospel of Mary, we understand the primary teacher in the Gospel of Mary, who is Mary Magdalene herself, was one of Jesus' closest students. The exact nature of Jesus and Mary's relationship, in my opinion, will stay ambiguous. I believe that Jesus personally was probably married, as were a lot of the disciples. Their wives are not really spoken about in the Bible. However, in that time frame for a Jewish man around the age of Jesus or his disciples to not be married would have been very taboo. However, there are many people, scholars and laymen alike, who do believe that Mary Magdalene was Jesus's wife. I am completely open to that being a possibility. However, we don't have concrete proof of that, so that's again why I say I'm pretty ambiguous about it. However, in one of the Hebrew temples in Jerusalem, they have found a mosaic of Mary and Jesus. And this mosaic shows Mary and Jesus together in the center like a couple, the yin and the yang, the male and the female, perhaps Mary herself would be considered Jesus's Shakti, 
whatever. All we know is this mosaic in this Hebrew temple does show them together with the 12 disciples around them. This is pretty significant. It means that they were a union of some sort. Again, whether that be husband and wife or his favorite student, the person that would be his param guru that would continue his teachings after his death. I don't know. Only time will tell. And perhaps only time will tell when we're able to get into the Vatican Library and see what information the Vatican holds on this situation of Mary and Jesus. So what do we know about Mary Magdalene? Well, we know that Mary Magdalene was a very significant leader in the early Christian movement. She was a student of Jesus Christ and she was, yes, one of his apostles. However, I think that most people are aware that Mary was not a prostitute. Yes, the original Christian church, the Catholic church that became the Orthodox church, tried to sneer at Mary Magdalene for whatever reason, I can only speculate, and paint her into a prostitute instead of who she really was. The invention of her being a prostitute was started in 591 AD by Pope Gregory the Great at one of his Easter services. You see, when we meet Mary, we meet her with another Mary of Bethany and what is called a sinful woman who falls at Jesus' feet and cleans his feet with her hair. Many people believe that that was Mary Magdalene, but the Bible is pretty clear that it was a different woman. This woman was the reformed prostitute, not Mary. Again, the Bible is pretty clear about this. Now in 591 AD, not many people were literate, and so this was a great opportunity for a corrupt Catholic church that's been corrupt ever since Constantine the Great, since the very beginning, to start to smear the name of Mary Magdalene. You could say it was because she was a woman, could be, I don't know, but there's also an opinion, and I kind of tend to lead towards this opinion, that they wanted to smear her because she was one of Jesus's most beloved students, and she was the one that really seemed to understand what Jesus was teaching. And if you have a corrupt corporation that's based around this state religion of Christianity, then you don't really want your churchgoers to truly understand what Jesus was teaching because if they did truly understand what Jesus was teaching, they wouldn't need you anymore and you would lose power. However, the first group of Christians to start to question the narrative of Mary Magdalene was the Protestants in the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation pretty much happened because people learned how to read and started reading the Bible and they realized that half the shit the Catholic Church told them was in the Bible wasn't actually in the Bible. And that prompted people to want to reform the Christian religion, which is what caused the Protestant Reformation, which caused a lot of strife and division in our world. It's actually one of the founding principles of the Americans. We, we were mostly Protestant. However, in 1969, Pope Paul VI went back and corrected this little issue with Mary, making it official for the Catholic Church as well that Mary was not a prostitute. So if Mary wasn't a prostitute, who was she before she became one of Jesus's most beloved students, his apostles, and possibly maybe his wife? Well, she was a woman from the seaside town of Magdala. Now, Magdala was on the Sea of Galilee, which we know the Sea of Galilee, this whole area is a huge place in the Bible. It was a fishing town. This was a huge enterprise back in Mary's time. Now, Magdala does not exist anymore. It's just archeological digs now, but it does appear that Mary came from a pretty successful and wealthy family that made their money through the fishing business. We know that Mary was one of the few disciples or apostles of Jesus who was educated enough to be able to read and write at that time. And in fact, she read and she wrote both Greek and Latin outside of Aramaic in her own native languages. Now, beyond that, there isn't much we know about her family. We know that she's 
from this area because of the name Magdalene. Mary was a very popular Jewish name back in this time. It's still a popular name. My sister's name is Mary. And so in order to distinguish between peoples, they would be labeled as something else. This is where we get surnames from. So Mary was distinguishable for her group of people as Mary Magdalene, as Mary from Magdala. Now, Mary had her own wealth. We know this in the Bible. She had her own money that she used to help support Jesus that was not a part of the community purse. If you remember back from our vampire episode that we did on the Dark Outpost, we talked about this community purse with Judas and the whole idea that maybe Judas was in charge of the purse and was kind of in the banking role and was possibly a vampire according to some other missing text from the Bible and would steal money from the community purse. Well, Mary's money, again, was separate from that. Well, where would a woman get money like that from? She would get it from her family. It is also believed that Mary was extremely pious in her Jewish faith. Again, not a prostitute at all. During this time, the Roman Empire was ruling over all these villages and these provinces that were lived in by the Jewish people. Same was for Magdala. Now, the Roman Empire ruled by tyranny. There was heavy taxes placed on the Jewish people, and they would worship their pagan gods in Jewish temples. And if any of the Jewish people tried to fight back against the tyranny of the Roman Empire, they would be crucified. So we see the Roman Empire using terror in order to try to keep the Hebrew people in line. So with this, this issue happening in Galilee, in this whole area, we have many Jews that were very excited about the promise of the Messiah. They felt like when the Messiah came that they would be liberated from this Roman rule. What they didn't understand is that the Messiah was going to come one time, give his life, and then come back another time thousands of years later. One thing I found also very interesting in my study of this time is that the Roman Empire did not like it when groups of Jewish people would huddle together. Yes, you heard that right. The Roman Empire wanted them to socially distance themselves from each other. Sounds familiar, right? They didn't want them to be able to have power in numbers. They wanted to control everyone through fear mongering, through terror. It's amazing how history always repeats itself. Now, we're not quite sure how Mary met Jesus. It's not really recorded in the Bible, and it could possibly be in the Gospel of Mary, but we are missing a bunch of it, so we're not really sure. But it is believed that she probably met him in passing, just as he had met his other disciples in passing. Many people probably believe she met him on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. The Bible does mention that Jesus exorcised seven demons outside of Mary. However, the exorcism with Mary doesn't seem like it was that big of a deal. It wasn't as showy as, as some other exorcisms that Jesus did in the Bible. And so people often wonder if Mary's exorcism was maybe a little bit different than we think of today when we hear exorcism. Back in Mary's time, illnesses were called demons. And many historians believe that there is a possibility that Mary was epileptic. If she was epileptic and she had seizures, it might look like she was possessed, but we now know that that's, it's, it's just a disorder, it's epilepsy. There is a possibility that when Jesus did the exorcism, he, he healed her of her epilepsy. And at that moment, she recognized that Jesus was the promised Messiah and decided to follow him. By her starting to follow Jesus, she is like all the other apostles. They all put targets on their back. Again, the Roman Empire did not like Jewish people grouping together, especially under this person that's causing all sorts of issues in the community named Jesus. With the seven demons, we also will see in the Gospel of Mary that this could also mean the seven attachments of the mind. You see, Mary's Gospel is very yogic. It's about controlling the mind, nature versus the soul, prakriti versus purusha.
And we'll get into that, into her gospel. It could be that she became enlightened, that she understood what Jesus was saying and that you have to cut off these attachments of your own mind in order to find true peace and true salvation. But with the meaning of the seven demons, again, that is your decision on what that means. We do know that Mary was present for the Last Supper with Jesus. In fact, Mary was the one that always served Jesus, which is a very important role to be the one to always serve the Messiah. It is believed that Mary was also present with Jesus when he was praying before he was arrested. And she must have known when he was arrested what would happen to him. She was also present for his crucifixion, another thing that would have put a huge target on her back for the Romans. And of course, Mary was the one that Jesus came to first when he had resurrected. He told her to go and tell all the other apostles what had happened. This makes Mary the apostle to the apostles. That's a pretty important and significant role. Now we see in the Bible that many of the disciples do have issue with Mary because she is a woman. However, we see in the Gospel of Mary that she's often reminding them that the, the nature of a person, the sex, the gender, that's all that is, that the soul is genderless. The soul, the eternal, has no ties to any type of physical being. Now, the disciple that has the biggest problem with Mary is Peter. Now, Peter's role in the history of the Christian church, as we've been taught, is the person that is the rock of the church. Jesus told him to, to go and be the leader. He is where the Vatican is. He is St. Peter's Basilica. But through these missing gospels, we see a bit of a different side of Peter. In fact, in the missing gospels, we see Jesus telling people to follow James the Just, Jesus's brother, who ends up running the temple in Jerusalem. We see a Peter who is very violent, who has a lot of rage, who is very opposed to Jesus, who is very confrontational with Mary. And I find this very fascinating. Was there a manipulation about Peter and the other gospels that we have in our canonized Bible? Do these missing books tell a totally different story? And if so, who was Peter exactly? I guess we'll just have to keep reading all the hit gospels to know for sure. But with the Gospel of Mary, we do see Peter com being very confrontational with Mary and other gospels coming up. We're going to see that Mary was afraid of Peter. This is odd to me. This is a woman who defied the Roman Empire. She put a target willingly on her back. She doesn't strike me as someone who scares easily. So why was she afraid of Peter? What was it about Peter that scared her? And we do see the other disciples start to come to her defense and take her side over Peter's. Now, after Jesus' resurrection, the Bible doesn't really give us much information on what happens to Mary. We do know that Mary ended up going to France. Now, there was a book called The Golden Legend that was written in the Middle Ages, around 1,200 years after Jesus died. And this book does talk about Mary's journey to France after the resurrection. Now, she did stay in the area of the Middle East for about 14 years, teaching the gospel, teaching Jesus's message until she absolutely had to leave the area. Again, all these apostles, all these disciples were all fugitives. And so she got on a boat with members of her family and ended up in the south of France. They ended up finding a, finding a pagan temple where they lived. And this was the first place where Mary taught and she converted all the pagans to this new Christian faith. Well, the monarchy at that time started to hear about this woman, this Hebrew woman, who was teaching this new religion in their country. And they went to go greet Mary. They were very skeptical of her faith at first. And they told her that if she could show a miracle to them, that they would accept her faith. 
the wife, the queen, wanted a son. She had not had a son yet. And so Mary prayed and prayed and prayed that the queen would have a son. And lo and behold, a son was born. At that point, the king and the queen of France allowed Mary to baptize them into this new faith. According to the golden legend, Mary then spent the last part of her life living as a recluse in the wilderness of France. She spent 30 years as this lady in the woods, mystic recluse. She just was in prayer and meditation until she finally passed away. Now, her body is supposedly still in the south of France. You can go and visit it. Now we're gonna end this episode today going through the material that we do have of the Gospel of Mary. It's not that long, there's not that much of it, so I feel like we can probably get it in on this video. I will also be adding some commentary and some of my thoughts into the Gospel of Mary as we read through it. If you don't wanna listen to it, if you'd rather just read it for yourself, then I highly recommend reading it for yourself. So if you're signing off right now, I just wanna tell you I hope that you had a wonderful Christmas and are looking forward to an incredible new year. We will be back again on Friday with a whole new story. Next week for The Dark Outpost, we are gonna be going over the Gospel of Philip. And for everybody who wants to stick around and listen, let's get started with the Gospel of Mary. The Gospel of Mary starts at chapter 4. Pages 1 to 6 of the chapter are missing, and chapters 1 through 3 are lost. So the first line of what we have or meaning of the Gospel of Mary says, Will matter then be destroyed or not? Now for me, this means that this is the matter or substance of the mind becoming destroyed. Again, those attachments to matter, this is where suffering comes from. So Mary is asking, will this suffering coming from the mind and its attachments be destroyed? Now Mary is talking to Jesus. The next verse says, the Savior says, all matter, all formations, all creation exist in and with one another, and they will be resolved again into their own roots. To me, this means that the world interacts in both prakriti and parusha. So again, we have the physical world and the spiritual, emotional, and mental world. We also see an openness and a privateness, a formation of behavior. Awakened people will understand that there is also another world beyond the mind's attachment. We heavily see this now as we move into the Great Awakening. A lot of people talk about moving from three-dimensional thinking into five-dimensional thinking. When you live in three-dimensional thinking, you are living in the matrix that has been created by the deep state. When you have moved into five-dimensional thinking, you, you see the trick, you see the matrix, and some of your attachment will start to fall away as you realize there is a powerful spiritual force behind you. The Gospel of Mary goes on to say, for the nature of matter is resolved into the roots of its own nature alone. So it's saying the mind will revert back to its natural state. Basically, everything is going to dissolve itself. It's, it's going back to Genesis. It's the end is the beginning and the beginning is the end. We see this in the book of Thomas as well. In fact, the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of Thomas are very similar. Gospel of Mary goes on to say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then it goes on to say, Peter said to him, since you have explained everything to us all, Tell us this also, what is the sin of the world? The Savior said there is no sin, but it is you who make sin when you do the things that are like the nature of adultery, which is called sin. Basically, when you sin, you're going against what is moral and what is right. Now, in order to go against what is moral and what is right, we have to actually understand what is moral and what is right. I know a lot of churches have what we call the age of accountability, where eventually we come to an age where we, we understand right from wrong. And so basically, Jesus is saying here that 
When he's talking about adultery, he's not actually talking about the specific act of adultery, although that, that is a sin when you're going to hurt somebody else by, by betraying them. He's saying anytime you do something that you know is going to hurt somebody else, then you are sinning and you have the choice whether you make that action or not. In yoga, the first law of yoga is ahimsa or nonviolence. So you always act in a state of not trying to hurt anybody else. The Gospel of Mary goes on to say, that is why the good came into your midst, to the essence of every nature in order to restore it to its root. So basically, Jesus is saying, "Uh, look, I came to earth as God to remind you of who you really are and that you are worthy of love. And if you know you are worthy of love and are loved, you too will not sin against your fellow man and cause him harm because you start to see that everybody is the same. Again, this goes back to the gospel of Thomas, right? Where we talked about the twin, that there's a possibility that Jesus came to earth to remind you that you are a child of a living God, as is your father fellow man. And when you start to recognize that, when you start to see the light inside of other people, you will not hurt people intentionally. It goes on to say, then he continued and said, that is why you became sick and die for you are deprived of the one who can heal you. Basically, this is saying to become spiritually corrupt because you basically forgot who you are. Like you, you're, you basically forgot that you are a child of God and that is why you suffer and why you fall ill to these attachments versus, versus being able to step back and say, oh my God, this is, I, I'm a child of God. This is beneath me doing these horrible things. The gospel of Mary goes on to say, he who has a mind to understand, let him understand. Then it says, matter gave birth to a passion that has no equal, which proceeded from something contrary to nature. Then there arises a disturbance in its whole body. So yeah, the attachment of the mind can cause suffering. It's what causes depression or or low self-esteem. It can cause people to, to commit acts or crimes of passion. You know, if we look at the actual idea of adultery, a lot of people cheat because there's a suffering within their own mind. It really has nothing to do with their partner. They're, they're like a slave to their own thought process. And in the Gospel of Mary, it becomes very apparent that we're trying to learn, Jesus is trying to teach us how to recognize these attachments for what they are and therefore not act on them. The gospel of Mary goes on to say, that is why I said to you, be of good courage. And if you are discouraged, be encouraging in the presence of different forms of nature. So you basically have the choice to, to pick peace. Like you can learn to control your mind so that you're in a state of peace. It goes on to say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. When the blessed one has said this, he greeted them all saying, peace be with you. Receive my peace unto yourselves. Beware that no one leads you astray saying, lo here or lo there for the son of man is within you. Again, that reverts back to the gospel of Thomas or Didymus, the twin, that you are the twin of God. The son of man is within you. For those who seek him will find him. Go then and preach the gospel of the kingdom. Do not lay down any rules beyond what I appointed you and do not give a law like the law givers, lest you be constrained by it. So this is saying, I found this really interesting in my own opinion. So it's saying that God's rules exist within the soul, not the outer world. So God's rules are basically the Ten Commandments and the two laws that Jesus gave us, which is love thy God with all thy heart and love each other as I have loved you. And if we look back again at what this idea of sin is, is this knowing, knowing the idea of cause and effects and understanding that we have suffering because of the attachments of the mind, that the God's boundaries are within our soul. They don't exist in our world. And they're also warning us, like, don't follow laws that were not given to you by God, because it's only going to calls you pain. And we see many, 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 many laws established by the Catholic church as well as the Protestant churches that aren't really in the Bible. And this is a warning. So maybe that's another reason why they didn't let the gospel of Mary be in the Bible. 
All right. The gospel says, when he said this, he departed. So students or people should be left alone to contemplate and meditate and pray without any other personal rules. Yeah, this is saying like, like I said this on the dark outpost last week. We say this in yoga. When, uh, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. But when the student is really ready, the teacher will disappear. There comes a time when you don't need any more guidance. We see this again in the Gospel of Thomas where he's like, listen, Jesus is telling his disciples, basically, I'm, I'm totally paraphrasing, but like he's like, look, guys, I got to go. I've already been resurrected. I, ha- I have to go. It's now your turn to go out and teach this. You don't need me anymore to be here with you. I will be here with you in spirit in a different way, but I've given you everything you need. Now go and teach. At this point, we move on to chapter five. Chapter five starts by saying, but they were grieved. They wept saying, how shall we go to the Gentiles and preach the gospel of the kingdom of the son of man? If they did not spare him, how will they spare us? So this again goes back to the idea that Mary was not afraid of the terrors of the Roman empire. Uh, The new Testament challenged the teachings of the temple or the matrix. It challenges the idea of the satanic world, of the cult of Saturn, of, of what we live in today, the deep state, as it's called the cabal. Um, the, the, the New Testament is here to set men free and to see the deep state, to see the matrix, to see everything, the 3D world for what it is. However, we're seeing that the the apostles, the disciples are afraid to go out and start to preach because they, they know what's going to happen. They know that they're going to be possibly killed for it. And most of them did get killed for it. Most of them were martyred. The gospel of Mary goes on to say, then Mary stood up, greeted them all and said to her brethren, do not weep and do not grieve nor be irresolute for his grace will entirely be with you and protect you. Again, she's saying like, buck up guys, come on, you can do this. It goes on to say, but rather let us praise his greatness for he has prepared us and made us into men. Again, this is referring back to the fact that the soul has no gender and that we are all the same to God, men and women alike. And we do see that with Jesus. He did not just marry, he had multiple female students, which was revolutionary back then during this time. The gospel of Mary goes on to say, when Mary said this, she turned their hearts to the good and they began to discuss the words of the savior. Peter said to Mary, sister, we know the savior loved you more than the rest of women. So here we see Peter is still like super hot headed and angry about the fact that, um, Mary was loved by Jesus the most and taught in private with him. And he still sees her as a woman when Jesus has basically told them, you are all the same within your soul. The gospel of Mary goes on to say that Peter then said, tell us the words of the savior, which you remember, which you know, but we do not, nor have we heard them. Mary answered and said, what is hidden from you? I will proclaim to you. This basically means, in my opinion, that Mary is saying, like, it was hidden from you because you didn't understand. I got it, but you didn't. The gospel goes on to say, and then she began to speak to them these words. I, she said, I saw the Lord in a vision. And I said to him, Lord, I saw you today in a vision. And he answered and said to me, blessed are you that you did not waver at the sight of me. For where the mind is, there is the treasure. Calm the mind so the soul does not waver. My teacher in India always says like yoga or meditation is about mental focus. It's not just sitting there and having this blank thought in your head. It's actually learning how to sharpen your mind and focus your mind so that the attachments of the mind are at bay. The gospel of Mary goes on to say, I said to him, Lord, how does he see the vision, see it through the soul or through the spirit? The savior answered saying, he does not see through the soul nor through the spirit, but the mind that is between the two, that is what sees the vision and it is. The rest of the pages are now missing from this manuscript, but basically we can see in my opinion, that Jesus is basically once again talking about how the soul is what matters. The physical body is just that. It's just nature. It's not forever. It's not eternity like the soul is. 
So here we skip all the way to chapter eight because we have so much missing between chapter five and chapter eight. And basically, this is believed to be the missing information of the Battle of Light and Darkness, which we talked about in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Again, the Dead Sea Scrolls are very much a part of the missing books of the Bible, as is a lot of these uh, Gospels that were found in Egypt. Now, chapter 8 starts with the word it, because we don't have any of the information before it. And then after that, it goes to verse 10 that says, In desire said, I did not see you descending, but now I see you ascending. Why do you lie since you belong to me? We can take this to mean that desire is attachment and it has become the master of the soul. I can definitely say in my life that is very true. I'm sure for most people, you could see how your desire, or your attachment to some reality you think you need has become the master of all of your being. That's why God says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. This is what it's really talking about. It's talking about this mental attachment. But once we've worked on that, once we've done the work, we can now the soul can see desire for what it is, that it's not really real. It's just thought. That's it. And we know that no man can serve two masters. So part of understanding the way your mind work is first seeing it for what it is. And that's what I believe is saying. It's saying here. So verse 11 says from chapter eight, the soul answered and said, I saw you, you did not see me nor recognize me. I served you as a garment and you did not know me. So now the soul is basically saying that I have the light of understanding and now I, the soul, control desire and this desire, this attachment does not control the soul. Verse 12 says, when it is said this, the soul went away rejoicing greatly. The soul is now free of desire. The mind is not in control anymore, but the spirit, the soul is. Verse 13 says, again, it came to the third power, which is called ignorance. So ignorance is an interesting word. Ignorance does not mean stupidity. Rather, it means the rejection of knowledge. So ignorance is intentional. And when we have intentional ignorance, we then cast judgment, right? I think we all understand that. Verse 14 says, the power questioned the soul saying, where are you going? In wickedness, you are bound, but you are bound. Do not judge. And the soul says, why do you judge me? Although I have not judged, I was bound, though I have not bound. Verse 17 said, I was not recognized, but I have recognized that all is being dissolved, both the earthly things and heavenly. So basically, in my opinion, all is this is all about the mind like the, the, the everything that the mind perceives as real the soul now recognizes is only an illusion that creates an attachment or a false god and so now it's dissolving itself and the soul is returning to itself verse 18 says when the soul had overcome the third power it went upwards and saw the fourth power which took seven forms so powers are like beast and beasts are hard to tame. So if you want to be in a state of sovereign sovereign peacefulness, then you're gonna have to get in control of your own mind. We see this taught again in yoga as well and as like Buddhism, that we have to be able to understand the illusion of our own attachments. The fourth power is the power of death, which is also, again, the power of life. The fear of death is the hardest power to overcome. And so, yes, of course, we know mortality. We in yoga, we say a lot of times that um, a lot of times your practice is to prepare for your own death. So I get that. And this is what I said in the beginning about the seven demons that Jesus exercised out of Mary. It could have been epilepsy, but it also could have been referring to the fact that she she actually found enlightenment through Jesus's teaching and she found a connection to her own soul. All right, verse 19 says, when the first form is darkness, the second desire, the third ignorance, the fourth is the excitement of death, the fifth is the kingdom of the flesh, and the sixth is the foolish wisdom of flesh, the seventh is the wrathful wisdom. These are the seven powers of wrath. Again, these are the fallen angels. This is when the soul does not know what it is anymore and it cannot, it it attaches to a physical body versus the fact that the physical body is not meant to be here forever, but the soul is. So again, this goes back to the exorcism. You know, what, what was that really about? 
All right, verse 20 says, They asked the soul, Whence do you come, slayer of men? Or where are you going, conqueror of space? So they're looking at the soul like, Oh my God, you've totally you've totally changed. Because darkness cannot understand the light, right? The space the soul conquered is the space of the mind. Now, now the mind is not in control, but yet the soul is in control of the mind. The consciousness is in control of the mind. So therefore, once that happens, you are not, you as a human being are not a slave to your emotion, to the passion of emotion. And once you are not a slave to the passion of emotion, you will probably not sin as much because you are aware, you have awareness of your, of other people who have the same affliction around you. Verse 21 says, the soul answered and said, what binds me has been slain and what turns me about has been overcome. 22 says, and my, my desire has been ended and ignorance has died. 23 says, in an aeon, I was released from a world and in a type from a type and from a filter of oblivion, which is transient. So you're, you're free of change at that point, right? You're not, you're not, a, you're not enslaved to your own thought. Verse 24 says, from this time on, I will attain the rest of time of the season of the eon in silence. Basically, that's enlightenment. You're, you're liberated from the chains that bind you. You're free. Now we're going to move to chapter 9. Verse 1, chapter 9 said, When Mary had said this, she fell silent, since it was to this point that the Savior had spoken with her. Again, in my opinion, Mary understood the true teachings of Jesus. Verse 2 says, But Andrew answered and said to the brethren, Say what you wish to say about what she has said. I at least do not believe the sayer had said this, for certainly these things are a strange idea. So basically, Andrew doesn't seem to have the same level of enlightenment as Mary. He doesn't quite get it. Verse 3 says, Peter answered and spoke concerning the same things. Again, Peter is just have no freaking clue. He's a hothead. He's angry. He has no clue. Verse 4 says, he questioned them about the Savior, he being Peter. Did he really speak privately with a woman and not openly to us? Are we to turn about and listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? So like Peter's pissed now. He's mad because Jesus shared things with a woman and not with him. Jesus took favor with Mary and not with him. But again, that shows the division that that Peter had that he thought that he and Mary were different because of their matter. When the whole thing is just property, it's just nature and the soul is what is important. I think we have a hard time understanding this today because our world is so different now, but it really is just Peter just has no clue. Verse 5 says, Then Mary wept and said to Peter, My brother Peter, Peter, what do you think? Do you think that I have made up this myself in my heart or that I am lying about the Savior? Verse 6 says, Levi answered and said to Peter, Peter, you have always been hot-tempered. So Levi is sticking up for Mary at this point. He's like, you, Peter, are a hateful, vengeful, violent man, and you've always been this way. Nothing about you has actually changed, and I believe Mary. That's a pretty big deal back in those days to stick up for a woman. Um, so that must have been pretty impactful. Levi must have had some level of understanding that that Peter did not. Verse 7 says, Now I see you contending against the woman like the adversaries. But if the Savior made her worthy, who are you in, indeed to reject her? Surely the Savior knows her very well. So again, Levi standing up for Mary like, who are you to reject this woman if Jesus, if God, the incarnation of God, the Messiah, felt like she was the most worthy of all of us? If if he gave her teachings that he didn't give us, then who are we to second guess Jesus? But like I said, we're going to see throughout the missing gospels where um, good old Peter is constantly kind of nitpicking Jesus and trying to like buck the system a little bit. All right, verse 9 says, But it is why he loved her more than us. Rather, let us be ashamed and put on the perfect man and separate as he has commanded us and preach the gospel, not laying down any other rule or any other law than what the pa Savior has said. So again, Peter is still seeing Mary as a physical being and not a soul. So do not, again, we've already seen this. God said, do not create any rules that are not 
taught by God, which is exactly what the church has done, which is interesting why they have built the Vatican on top of Peter. Gives you a little foreshadowing into what we might be seeing to come in some of the missing gospels. And then the last verse we have of the gospel of Mary says, and when they heard this, they began to go forth to proclaim and to preach. All right, guys, that was the Gospel of Mary. That's all we have. I really do, do, do wish that you all get a copy of the Gospel of Mary and read it for yourself. Um, again, we will be back on Friday with a new video. Thank you so much to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase the opening song, it is down in the description box below. And thank you, as always, to Todd Froderick for helping me get this video out to you guys today. I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas and are looking forward to a very happy new year. And I will talk to you soon. Bye.